Welcome everyone to the final plenary of the Transforming Women's Leadership Pathways. Each working group will make recommendations that answer the question, what will it take to achieve women in leadership by 2030? I first acknowledge the Bedjigal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which the University of New South Wales stands. I pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and I extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Throughout this month of October, each of our working groups has met and debated intensely. This has added up to an eight hour think tank overall. What a challenge. And thank you so much for rising to that challenge. You have all dedicated so much time, energy, passion and ideas. The feedback and updates we have received throughout the event have been inspiring and we thank you. And now, without further ado for what we've all been waiting for, it is time to hand over to our facilitator, Jenny Granger, to introduce our working group's presentations, giving the headlines of their action plan recommendations. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Eileen. And hello, everyone. I hope you've had time for breakfast, lunch or dinner, depending on where you are in the world, and that you're well settled in, because we are hoping that you are also going to be able to contribute today. We have 10 presentations for you today, which will be running in groups of four and then two groups of three. And between those, we're going to have some panels. And we're going to be really setting a cracking pace. We've set the challenge for our presenters to be able to give the headlines on their action plans in about three minutes. And for the panel to answer questions about uh, those action plans presentations in about 10 minutes. So we're going to be fairly disciplined, but we are hoping that we will also include some questions from you. So first of all, just a little bit of housekeeping from me because I actually can't see your hands raised in, on digital. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to post via the link you're on uh, questions when Lily, our project manager, opens um, the window for those. So she'll pop in a message saying it's now open for questions and she'll close it again at the end of the presentations. And why are we being so organised about that? That's because Lily and I aren't in the same place. She's in Sydney and I'm in Canberra. So she's sending them through to me on my phone. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of juggling to pick up your questions and ask them. And we do hope that we are going to be able to answer all of them, but we may not because 10 minutes isn't a very long time. So uh, any that we don't get to answer via the panel or we, we can't do virtually on the spot, Lily will be in touch with you while you're still online and just um, work out with you how she'll get an answer back to you. So here we go. We're ready for our very first round of presentations. And in our first group, we have four presentations. And these cover really vital sectors. Well, actually, all the sectors are vital, but these sectors have been responsible for innovations that have changed how we work and live. And it is now my pleasure to call on our first presenter, Scientia Professor Veena Sahajwala, the lead of the Science Working Group, to present their key recommendations on what it will take. Over to you, Veena. Thank you very much, Jenny, and I'd like to again uh, thank um, all the organisers for uh, giving us this opportunity to really come together as this incredible working group in science. So it's been my absolute privilege and pleasure uh, to work with amazing bunch of women who are so passionate. And I think this kind of leads to the first point around what we would like to recommend is redefining leadership. So what we are really asking um, to consider and to really bear in mind that leadership really has to be holistic. Leadership has to recognize that there are many diverse pathways and of course the diverse styles, but I think the core element that we all have agreed and recognized that we need to put or utmost attention to impact that leaders can create, whether we are taking on roles in universities, in industry and government. And leaders, of course, 
have to inspire others through their actions and through their impact. So it's been an incredible discussion point for us that we've hinged this keyword around impact and how indeed our impact journey has to be recognized. So the key goal in what we talk about, and if I can move on to the next slide, please, which talks about our impact journey, it really allows us to recognize that women as part of their work do so much in terms of creating impact. And of course, that then means that recognition of leadership has to be given that captures both our ability to, of course, do the science, but also equally importantly, deliver impact. And that is really something that we are calling out for in recognizing that this particular feature of how we've seen leadership come through and shine actually then means that it needs to recognize, it needs to take into account those human-centered attributes in addition to technical skills. And of course, as part of this impact journey, we also need to acknowledge the importance of science communication and engagement. And this engagement ultimately, when is undertaken in a way that inspires action, it actually shows that it delivers outcomes it delivers outcomes for public good, for people, for our planet. And ultimately, that's really what science is all about, is how do we actually make sure that in our everyday lives, we are indeed uh, delivering on impact. What that then means is leaders have to, in fact, demonstrate through their actions and inspire others. If I can move on to the next slide, we really have to, of course, then therefore talk about how do we actually recognize and reward those amazing attributes and, and all of that amazing work that women do where they are holistic in their approach towards inspiring others and indeed do so much in terms of their engagement with their communities, with their industries, with government, with media. And of course, all of this then means that we need to clearly define metrics, metrics that in fact capture clearly capture in a way that is transparent so that that can then be taken into account in terms of promotion and recruitment. And of course, what that then means is that women will, in fact, be able to not only be recognized for their brilliant science um, and, and the work that they do within their organizations, but also be recognized for the work that they do and contribute to how they have this impact outside indeed of their traditional uh, domains of science and the discipline in which they work in. So from our point of view, we of course um, have indeed talked about the fact that there's got to be adequate reward recognition that captures the work in a way that is part of the contribution and therefore indeed the recognition so that ultimately women are promoted and indeed able to demonstrate all of their skill sets. So from our point of view, the ability to indeed capture um, all of these attributes, the human attributes is extremely important. I'd like to of course um, acknowledge and thank that we've had some incredible women from industry, Sharon from Tezam, Libby from CSIRO, who have really helped us um, capture these ideas and bring it all together. I'd like to also acknowledge the fact that we've had some incredible student ambassadors and the overall working group of science has been absolutely tremendous. And it's been a pleasure and a privilege for me uh, to uh, lead this amazing bunch of women. I'd like to now hand over to Claire. Thank you so much for this brilliant opportunity. So Claire, it's over to you. Thank you, Vina. Thank you. And listening to your presentation, it um, strikes me that there are going to be some common themes running through um, our action plans because um, I, I think it's very inspiring what you've what you've brought together, and it, it rings true with many of the things that we've discussed. So, could we have um, next slide, please? Um, next slide, please. So I'm Claire and I'm the, the chair of the Medicine and Life Sciences Working Group. Um, unlike many um, 
maybe some of the other groups. We don't actually have a problem attracting women into medicine and life sciences. Um, more than 50% of medical students and junior doctors and postdoctoral life scientists are women. But the problem is in science, very few of these actually get tenure. And so when you look further down the line, they only occupy between 15 and 37% of the senior leadership positions. And that's across academia and it's across industry. And we're very aware that it's also very often across government. These, there have been many previous initiatives which have attempted to address this gender inequalities. We've had Athena Swan in the UK and now SAGE in Australia. And um, these have um, helped us understand the problem, but they haven't progressed it very rapidly. And so we need to work, come up with um, plans that are going to accelerate this change. Next slide, please. So when we thought about what would um, success look like in 2013, we we talked about um, what might change and we thought there would be three pillars that would change. One would be transparency that uh, you've heard about from Vina. that's really important metrics that are across universities and industries and government that allow us to really understand how far we've come and how far we have yet to go. And once we've understood our position where we are, we lead a strong and bold and far reaching set of policies that are going to accelerate that change. And ultimately, we felt the most important change will be a cultural shift. And this will lead to a diverse um, and sustainable representation at the top, where we won't need to be constantly putting new policies in place to achieve it. It will just happen. So our recommendations that we've come up um, are listed here, and they come under those three pillars of transparency and policy and culture. And for universities and industries, fundamentally, we need to connect, collect the data, the metrics, but not just about operation, but also about performance across the whole um, gamut of what we do. So are we, um, are women getting grants? Are women included on grants? Are women in our workforce? Are, we, are female patients included in our clinical trials? We have to include women across the board. We also felt it was important for universities to adopt some quotas. So we know the pipeline is there. There are many women at these junior positions. Why can't we have them getting tenured positions? We need to accelerate this, so we need to have quotas for that. The promotion process was something that came up very often in our um, discussions. And having a process that, as Vina says, recognises all of those other things that women do, the personal skills, the other commitments they have outside of their work? What is their productivity in the whole? What is their contextual position? We felt it's important for governments to mandate equality metrics when they're funding our public institutions and our large research programmes. This was very effective in Athena Swan in the UK and unfortunately that's now been withdrawn. We also want universities and industry and governments to embed a culture of speaking out. We felt that the narrative that's come out of the Me Too campaign was really effective, really helped to accelerate change. And we wanted to learn from that and allow women to speak out and call out when things aren't right for them. And finally, we felt that governments need to legislate. One of the things that holds women back is an assumption when they're going through the recruitment process that they may be taking long periods of time out for maternity leave. If this playing field can be levelled where either parent can take time out, we felt this assumption will go and the recruitment process will be fairer. So this is one of the um, bold actions that we would like governments to take. So um, with that, I'd like to really thank my um, working group um, companions who I've had a fantastic time with and they, we've worked really hard and have hopefully enjoyed this process. And I'd particularly like to thank our student ambassadors, Nandini and Rubana, who've been really helpful in this process and hopefully have learned something as we've gone along. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Professor Judy Raper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I'm delighted to be here and thank you. Thank you all. A lot of what you have said has resonated with the engineering um, working group as well, although we might be a little bit more cynical than some. Um, perhaps we could have the slides, please. Um, go move on to the next one. So, so the snapshot of our, our situation is that not much has changed in the last 20 years. You, you know, we have 25% female students in engineering across the USA, if you were in the UK and Australia in the 90s when I was at Sydney Uni, we had 17%. So, so not, not a lot has changed in, in those 20 years. 
Um, and we need to we need to do we need to be brave. Vina said it, I think. We need to be brave and do courageous things to really have a step change. But I'll get onto that in a minute. So the leaky pipeline, we all we've all talked about leak, leaky pipeline before. So we might have 25% girls doing engineering, but they get fewer and fewer as they progress. In industry, they um, they 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 don't go into industry. Some of them they do drop out. Um, it's an interesting comparison with developing countries because the statistics of students in engineering studies, girls in engineering studies in developing countries, is much better. There's there's fifty fifty, but they're not in leadership positions. So so that's the other thing. So it is a leaky pipeline there as well. Um, the culture of bullying and harassment is prevalent in some industries, not everywhere. There have been lots of initiatives, for sure. We've been talking about it a lot for the last five years. There's, there's a lot of goodwill, but we think that there are blind spots that emerge in, in many instances. And an example, you know, so one of our colleagues suggested a, a prize for, for female researchers or an, a recognition of female researchers in in um, who who showed significant improvement or just just outstanding success, and the the immediate response is no. But what will the, the men think? So that type of thing just just happens all the time, and and it's it's a sign that the culture is still something that we need to change. Next slide, please. So so we really we really found that we need to change the culture. We need to change two things, the culture and the narrative. So the narrative about engineering, the hard hats that appear in the, the sort of recruitment advertisements, and, and it sounds cliche to me because I've been talking about this for 40 years. So we used to we used to pick up on on having all men's all men in, in um, university recruitment ads and all men in hard hats and not showing the diversity that engineering offers to students. But it still happens, and that's what's what's so disappointing. And it doesn't happen because people mean to. It just happens because they're, they're, people are blind to it, and we all do it, and it's all that unconscious bias. Um, there are too few role models, and that that just goes goes with the, the fact that the pipeline is is still pretty low. But the main point is that the leaders need to be courageous and we need to make step changes. Okay, so the next slide, please. So the recommendations are, first of all, we use professionals to find better communications to change the narrative. So so do, should, do we have a film? Do we have a play? I, I'm sure a lot of you will remember David Williamson's The Department, which showed engineering of the time. Maybe we need a little bit more updated play like that, a GIF. So we need, we need to... And there are lots of good initiatives going on. As I said, um, there's lots of competitions and stuff, but it needs to be more prevalent. It needs to be ubiquitous. We thought we could take a lesson from the um, safety industry, from industry safety culture. That there's there's a, um, been a massive change in cu the culture of safety, and the reason that it's been accomplished is because the leaders have emphasised it. It's been extremely important, it's been mandated, reporting has been mandated, lead and lag indicators have to been determined and have to have been reported everywhere from the you know the site gate to, to the boardroom agenda. So so that's something that we could we could do. We also as the, the goodwill is there, we we need to develop tools that will help people easily overcome the, the issues, the cultural issues, the, the blind spots. And, and for examples from the, the women researchers, why don't we mandate prizes for women only and, and do things that are going to be uncomfortable for some people but and brave, but, but they really, really need to do it. And we have to enable everyone to call out blind spots every time they emerge and... and um, and we have to be responsible for doing that ourselves too. Um, and it was interesting, the definition of leadership and institutional resilience is important that allows for the failure of courageous activities and leaders. So, so a lot of women leaders we felt were reluctant to step up because of the fear of failure. 
there should be institutional resilience that helps people cope with that. So, so that was one of our things, provide opportunities for people, provide more opportunities than you need. So, so not everybody's going to emerge as the leader and not everybody wants to be, but provide the opportunities. And if people fail or don't, don't like it, it's not, it's not a, a negative. And, um, so there's lots of things to do. I think we we really discovered that there's a lots of things to do. And I just I, I also want to thank the working party. They're a very diverse group of women and men. And Amby, my co lead, pulled me up every time I forgot to do something. So thank you so much, and to Hannah, our student ambassador, everybody. It was it was great fun, and um, we hopefully have got somewhere. And I now I'd like to hand over to Lemuria. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Lemuria Carter. I'm the Technology Working Group Lead. I am the Head of School for Information Systems and Technology Management at UNSW Sydney. It has been a pleasure working on this initiative with a dynamic group of tech professionals who are passionate about women in leadership. So first, uh, I'll set the, the state of affairs for women in technology, similar to um, the scene for women in engineering. Currently, there is a shortage of women in the tech discipline. It is a challenge still to attract and retain women in the technology discipline, which then impacts the number of women in leadership. So currently, there are 26% um, of the computing jobs are held by women. There is also a higher turnover rate for women in technology than there is for men. And this all impacts, of course, the number of women who are make it to higher level leadership positions, a lower percentage of women serving as chief information officers, and low representation of women on boards. Next slide, please. So given that, we thought of a suite of aspirations that really target the pipeline as a whole. There is a shortage uh, of women in STEM disciplines in general and technology in particular. So our recommendation, or we thought by 2030, it would be great to increase the percentage of women in the STEM workforce by 10%, uh, provide equal pay for women. That was another thing that we talked about. Maybe to do that, we would start with the women in leadership um, and increase the percentage of female technology professionals on boards of all organizations. So in order to do that, what will it, will it take? It will take fueling, protecting, and celebrating the pipeline. So as it relates to fuel in the pipeline, there are a few barriers and opportunities for each of those stages. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a shortage of women in the STEM disciplines. This could be due to a host of reasons, stereotypes, recruitment bias. So it's important to start recruiting girls into tech uh, early, primary school, high school, early university, with regards to protecting the pipeline. Uh, there is a lack of gender equality in pay, and as I mentioned, a higher attrition rate for women than men in the technology industry. As others have mentioned, uh, flexible working conditions are definitely important, and sponsorship, positive matching, uh, reverse mentoring programs can be important to help with protecting the pipeline. And in terms of celebrating the pipeline, um, one of the key challenges is there's a lack of visible role models and the celebration of female leadership success stories. So given those barriers, those opportunities, we then came up with six recommendations in our action plan that are applicable to all, uh, all sectors. First, make women's success stories more visible and accessible by establishing and maintaining a recognition loop, either online or physical, where women's achievements are displayed regularly, highlight the projects and technical skills of women on technology teams. Uh, the second recommendation is to establish and empower gender equity working groups within organizations. These groups should include both men and women, and they need strong endorsement and engagement from senior executives. They should provide an opportunity for all people, but especially women, to come together, network, be inspired by stories, and be able to bring their whole selves to work. Uh, the third recommendation is uh, ensure that male and female employees have access to and are encouraged to utilize flexible working options and parental leave. 
Fourth, ensure organizations offer equal opportunities for interviews to both male and female applicants. Fifth, partner with initiatives such as the Male Champions of Change or Anita Borg Institute or the Global Institute of Women's Leadership. And our sixth and final recommendation in our action plan uh, was created in conjunction with our critical friend, Amanda Ellis. And we thought it would be great for this plus alliance group, this set of universities, to create an initiative that helps to prepare women for board participation. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lemuria, and thank you all our presenters, not just for going first, but for also, I think, really wetting our appetite. I've, I think um, it's really clear uh, that we do need a step change in all of those sector, sectors. And I really like what Judy had to say about, you know, we have to do some things that are uncomfortable and a bit brave. Um, so I think that's um, going to, I think that's a really good message. I'm going to move on to our first panel now, and hopefully, yes, we've got them up on screen already. Now, you might notice there's a slight change from presentation. Um, we have been joined by Professor Ilya Thambi and Bikai Raja as well. So welcome, Ambi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And um, thank you. We're already getting questions in, so I'm just going to start juggling between um, uh, with my phone to be able to do some questions for you as well. But my first question is to Veena. Um, Veena, science isn't your usual traditional boss of the business kind of leadership, is it? It's more about thought leader and excellence and um, expertise. Yeah. Yeah. And I. I was very interested that your recommendation, your very first one was on redefining leadership. Um, it's pretty clear, I'm assuming, that that is the priority game changer as far as the group's concerned. Um, I'd like you to just um, expand for us a little bit more on recognising impact delivery and particularly beyond traditional domains um, that, you know, maybe you could illustrate it for our audience, what you think would be those kinds of in impacts, because I think it's a little bit more than also recognising that there are other contributions people make. And how will that make a difference to women if it's recognised in that way? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Jenny. And, um, you know, you're absolutely right in, in capturing that point that uh, for our group, really um, starting with the notion that we have to absolutely get it right first and foremost, that is that ability to redefine leadership, because I think quite so often um, what's written down on paper uh, really doesn't necessarily capture all of these points. We've talked about impact and delivery of impact, which means we are actually saying that there is so much that women do um, as part of their everyday lives that goes really beyond that traditional sort of scientific impact, which of course is captured in promotion. So for example, if you think about, you know, impact through uh, publishing papers, um, supervising um, postgraduate students, all of those are of course um, captured. But I think what we all realize and and of course we all agreed on is it's only when we start to call it out and say that we have to redefine leadership that actually says that leadership is all about being holistic and of course all about ultimately inspiring others and in fact creating impact through their own actions so in fact first and foremost um, you know, female leaders um, in particular that we see um, do spend a lot of time in actually working on and inspiring others to be better human beings, if I can put it that way. This is that point about human skills. And I think to me, quite so often that gets unrecognized uh, and the effort and the work that goes into that um, gets unrecognized. And that, of course, means that all the hard work in delivering impact, which is why we talk so much about impact in our group, um, doesn't get recognized. So unless and until that's actually included uh, in the definition, uh, we're not going to be able to capture that in our metrics. And if we don't capture that in our metrics, we will not adequately recognize and reward the hard work. So to, to pick up on examples, uh, it could well be that, you know, women are indeed working towards providing their local communities, their local governments, industries, 
and, and others around them outside that traditional domain of their institute and, and scientific discipline. They're actually looking at translation of science into practice and improving well-being of people. So that, that impact that they create in terms of social benefits, economic benefits, and, and benefits overall in creating better outcomes for people, all of this, of course, if you then can recognize that and capture that and have, I think the words that were mentioned also around transparency is going to be important. So if we are going to indeed say that all of these attributes, human attributes are important, the, the contributions that amazing women leaders make and inspire younger and emerging leaders to come through and, and really not be afraid to try out. And I think, again, the points that were made by my esteemed panelists this morning, that to, to not be afraid to try out all the different pathways through which they can create impact. But that then is recognized and, and indeed celebrated. So if we can actually talk about how indeed the work that leaders do and emerging leaders can do and be inspired to do, uh, whether it is impact that they create on their communities or local businesses, um, needs to be captured and celebrated. So I think to me that then means that for our group, an important recommendation is redefining leadership by capturing impact. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bina. Um, Claire, I'd like to go to you next. We have a, a question from the audience. Did the group explore the reasons for the lack of women receiving tenure in this discipline? And can I just tack one on to that? Because I know you've um, recommended quotas. I'd like to know um, where you'd set the bar for the quotas and also what should be the consequences for not meeting it and who for? So if we could have a little bit, first of all, on um, the reasons and then what we might think are appropriate consequences if you don't change it. Thanks, Jenny. Um, yes, we did talk about um, why women aren't reaching tenure and we felt fundamentally um, it was multifactorial. There isn't one reason. But there's uh, one of the things we talked about is a lack of visibility um, of role models of women at the top. You've heard a lot about visibility of women and a, a lot of um, the junior um, researchers and doctors, they don't see people that look like them at the top. They don't they don't have that projection where they can look forward. And so um, if they don't have those leadership roles in their sites, the aspirations aren't necessarily there. Um, there's also um, issues around uh, recruitment when you're going for a tenured role. Um, we we do feel that there is some unconscious bias playing into that. So when um, women are going for uh, these tenured roles, are people on those interview panels thinking, oh, well, you're of childbearing age. It's not it's much safer bet to go for the man because we need this work to be done. And that's why we thought our recommendation about making paternity leave, parental leave shared between both parents would take away um, the risk of that occurring. Um, what was your second part of your question, Jenny? <laughs> It's, do, do you have a view on where the quota bar needs to be set and what should be the consequences for not meeting it and for whom? So th there was some discussion around this. We didn't come up with an absolute number, but I think in general we felt because there are as many women as men, if not more women than men in those early parts of the pipeline, there's no reason why that quota shouldn't be set at 50-50 <clears throat> and go straight for, for equity at, at the outset. If you're going to have a quota, it needs to reflect where you want people to be in the long run. Um, the um, I've, I've forgotten the second part of your question now. <laughs> Did you have a view on consequences? Oh, yes. The consequences comes down to funding. So one of the most important things um, that the Athena Swan process did was tie funding um, from government funding to institutions and they had to have a, a silver award in order to get that funding. Now unfortunately that has just this month been removed um, and it, it's been um, highlighted that this is because we've achieved uh, all these milestones and that we're much further down the line with gender equity and, and actually we felt as a group that that's a real shame because we didn't feel any of these milestones being particularly achieved. And we need to keep that uh, that 
pressure from government that if you don't meet these, you need to collect these metrics. And if you don't reach the standard, then you're not going to get that funding in the long run. And we thought that was a really important part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. And as a former tax collector, I've always had a strong belief in the um, influence on behaviour of financial incentives. <laughs> I think they're really good. Andy, can I um, ask you a question next? Yeah, please. Um, um, my ears really pricked up about the recommendation on um, exposing potential women leaders uh, to experience through vertical job sharing. Um, do you have, uh, could you talk to our audience a little bit about how that might work in practice? I'm interested in whether, also whether you see that as a developmental opportunity or is it um, even more uh, assertive, I guess is the right language than that. Is it actually grooming the successor in that situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah I can come in. Maybe I'll just give you a background that I've been a head of school for 10 years. I'm a deputy vice chancellor now. So I just give you an example in my school first, and then I can answer the question. So when I recruited, well, when I started in, as a head of school, we had one female staff and 30 male staff. There's a male dominated electrical engineering school. Now we have got seven female staff, academic staff members in the school. So we have recruited them. So when I recruited the first academic female staff, she was a lecturer and I recognized the leadership potential in her, but she never thought that she will become as a leader. So I worked with her and I had mentors for her. And then I brought her from lecturer to senior lecturer. Now she's an associate professor and she's a deputy head of school. So the leaders uh, need to recognize the potential very early and then need to support them and sponsor them all the way through. The way I believe is if female leaders can bring something different to their environment for the school or for the department or for wherever, and uh, we need to support them and give that opportunity so that they can actually bring something different than the male leaders. I can give you one example. I have never done this uh, survey, but if you ask the student, would you prefer a female lecturer or male lecturer? Majority of them will say female lectures. They, they look after them, they have patience, they hear the students, not like male lecturers, not, not everybody. So there are things that female um, academics can bring into to the, to, the, to the school, to the department, everything. So vertical job sharing, an example that I can give you. So what you do is that if you have an academic who's not keen in becoming a leader, but you give that chance that say, say okay, you do 50% of your time as become as a, you know, a mentor or become as a deputy head of school or become as a postgraduate coordinator. Give that opportunity while they are doing the other part as a lecturing. That gives the confidence for them. And then eventually they suddenly see, oh yeah, I can do this. So for example, in our school, we have got, well, in our faculty, we have got people uh, teaching as well as their associate deans as well at the moment. So that's what we call the vertical job sharing, that you give the opportunity to, to become eventually as leader. So I think I totally agree with the all of you. The one thing is the cultural change has to happen. Definitely. It's a slow process, but it is happening. At least at the University of New South Wales, it's happening. I can tell you the leader actually recognizes. Then leaders need to recognize this. And we need to have enough female leaders in the, in the higher positions. And that's also happening in the University of New South Wales. Over the last five years, I've seen, I've been there for 21 years, but I've seen that. So if it happens at the top, then it happens at the dean's level, then it happens at the school level. I think you would have the actual the leaderships required for 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 the whole university, and that you need to end at at the end of the day 50-50. So in Myanmar, I give you an example. I I said this example yesterday. In Myanmar government has set up for for the university entrance, they must have 50% female, 50% male. Otherwise, they won't allow the entry. Now, having said that. There are, if you look at Myanmar, one of the institutions, engineering institutions, they've got 80% female academic staff and 20% male academic staff. But when the leadership position comes, they're not female, they're all male. This is, there's more work to be done in Myanmar. So something needs to be set up at very early in the pipeline to make sure that you have 50-50 coming in. So that's my, my answer for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambi. 
And I'd like to now ask Lemuria our last question for our panel. Um, Lemuria, there's a really big challenge, isn't there, in STEM with only about 23% of the sector being women. And um, my understanding, because I've had a little look at your action plan in some more detail, is that the choices and preferences that you develop as early as primary school affects your attraction um, and, and, and flowing into this pipeline. So given, given that uh, and the need to fuel this pipeline, how do, we, how do we make STEM attractive to girls as young as in primary school? What's, what, what are the group's thoughts on what we can do to encourage more to take this pathway? Yeah, thank you. So one of the things, our first recommendation was to celebrate the role of women in leadership and the role of women in STEM and to highlight that these, this skill set can equip you to go into any industry and to make an impact on so many different organizations, on society in many different ways. So it's a critical set of skills that then can be applied across many different disciplines as a way to attract more girls into STEM and technology in particular. Thank you very much, Lemuria. And I'm sorry, but that is all we have time for, um, for with our first panel. So uh, thank you, Vina, Claire, Ambia, and Lemuria for being first and also for fielding question, questions without notice. It's really appreciated. I want to move on now to our next group of presentations. We have three for you from corporate, higher education, and politics and policy working groups. And to kick us off, here's Christine Gannon, co-lead of the Corporate Working Group. Over to you, Christine. Thank you so much. And if I could have the first slide, please. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. On behalf of myself and my co-lead, Dr. Tony Farmer Thompson, we'd like to extend a sincere thank you uh, to our entire working group, our student ambassador and critical friend, Jillian Siegel, who are all incredibly engaging, innovative, and forward thinking. And congratulations to all the working groups. The recommendations and findings so far have been phenomenal. Our group tackled the corporate work stream and with only 7.4% of CEO seats taken by women, um, Industry has really raised awareness around the need for female equity for years, and our working group took the challenge to come up with several recommendations. Next slide, please. Prior to launching the working group, Tony and I developed a framework and model that we proposed to our group that we use to shape our conversation. You'll see that framework here. And while these four areas aren't necessarily groundbreaking, the working group expanded the definition of each of these. For example, as you consider the preparation of women, consider a differentiated leadership preparedness curriculum that begins in college to help women shatter glass walls and ceilings before they even enter the work, workforce. And in doing so, corporations have the ability to grow a culture that removes their own limitations. Consider position, defined not only as positioning oneself for success, but in collaboration with corporations, designing customized leadership pathways and experiences that directly correlate to executive level roles. And we've heard many of the presentations so far talk about this. This includes job sharing and ensuring that women have access to roles that include P&L responsibility. We move on to promotion. So with the World Economic Forum projecting 200 plus years to attain gender equity, we propose refining and proliferating the practice of sponsorship for women. And lastly, placement, designing international intentional programming, again, that starts in college and creates a talent pool and pipeline of extraordinarily prepared women and creating unique access points for corporations and candidates. Next slide, please. These next four slides provide the specific recommendations behind each area of the framework. While we don't have time to delve into each of these recommendations, we'd like to spotlight a couple on each slide. As well, on each slide, you'll see the working group recommendation to consider both women and corporations. Women reflected as supply, the supply of women, and the demand corporations need for talented executive women. 
As we specifically consider preparation on the supply side, a recommendation for college level leadership and industry programming, which includes utilizing generational mentoring, thereby creating a generational waterfall and a pipeline of talent readily prepared. On the demand side, global implementation of the already successful Male Champions of Change program, which has been implemented successfully in Australia. We move on to the next slide, please, for position. As we consider position, one of the recommendations is that we implement standards that enforce sponsorship, not just mentoring for women, but sponsorship with intentional career pathing that's needed for women's advancement. And on the demand side, using best practices from the Australian Business Council, Council which leads, a, leads with a strong focus on data and it creates a more holistic approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. If we look at promotion, the third point in our framework, we see recommendations on the supply side to provide intentional lateral cross-functional positions. Again, as many have presented already today, intentional promotion into positions from a career pathway that was created in preparation. So they're following through up to promotion ensuring that women by this point have the skills that they need to enter into executive level roles and the C-suite. On the demand side, doing an assessment of corporate policy for flexibility and balance for all genders, prosecuting the data and assessing the corporation to determine, are these policies sustainable for all genders? And my last slide, please. Lastly, we look at placement. If women and corporations have created an intentional movement of advancement for women by preparing, positioning, promoting, we arrive at a place where for women who are interested, they're ready to be placed in impactful roles in the organization. Corporations globally can implement the CEO led dialogue and discourse roundtables that address where there are disproportionate ratios of women in key roles and not only begin to level the opportunities, but shift the culture so that equity is the fabric that binds an organization together. If women are ready, this, this is ready for them. At this point, placement is ready. My very last comment is about a recommendation that came up in our working group for investors and shareholders, that they really be held accountable for the boards that they sit on, the companies that they represent, to ensure that equity programming is not only implemented, but measured, analyzed, and improved. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Aaron Carr-Jordan for the Higher Education Working Group. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with everyone today. Uh, and like my uh, previous speakers, I would like to first thank uh, the incredible working group with whom we've had the honor uh, and great privilege of working for the last month uh, and our critical fun friend Libby Wentz uh, and our wonderful student ambassador and our guest speakers uh, Amanda Ellis uh, and Manu Ipe uh, without whom we couldn't have gotten to a plan today so uh, thank you to all of them. Uh, next slide please. So I think the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg said it best, we know women belong in all of the places where decisions are being made. That led us to our 2030 aspiration, which is ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in higher education. So what do we need to get there? We need a tone from the top. We need persistent and unwavering organizational commitment to women's leadership. We need to establish targets and measure our progress. And of course, we need funding. By failing to create ecosystems in which women in their full diversity can thrive and achieve their full potential, higher education will remain limited in its achievable success, its impact, and its value. Next slide, please. The data are clear. Higher education lags behind all other sectors when progress towards gender equity is considered. Women do more than half, excuse me, women do more than one and a half times the annual service compared to their male counterparts. Women outpace men in the number of conferred doctoral degrees, yet men outnumber women two to one in the highest level faculty ranks and in administrative leadership roles. Men also outnumber women two to one on university boards. 
only 39 of the top 200 universities are led by women. In the US, that means less than 30% of all universities. University presidents are women, and only 5% of those are women of color. In the UK, only 29% of VCs are women, and there are only 25 black women faculty. To address what is a systemic nature of the challenge, we call for a fundamental reimagining, reframing, and rebalancing of service to reflect leadership, engagement, and citizenship in higher education. Every facet of our institutions benefits from being more closely aligned with the values of collaboration, social engagement, and community outreach. This shift applies to faculty across all tracks, to staff and administrative professionals, and should be woven throughout the evaluation and recognition frameworks. Service is often perceived as less valuable than other metrics by which we are measured, yet the work is intricately tied to institutional success and should be valued accordingly. Second, we propose to establish an action-oriented international exchange, the PLUS Transforming Women's Leadership Alliance, an international community of practice and peer mentoring, peer mentoring network. By 2030, we will have grown to 2,030 members. We will use this network to identify women who are willing and able to lead, to conduct collaborative research, to develop resources and pathways to leadership, including distributed models that recognize leadership as an action rather than as a position and provide exemplar profiles that can be used as guides. By engaging the networks of our respective institutions, we will grow this with a legacy mindset and position the Alliance for long-term viability. And third, we will build a sustainable ecosystem through leadership development. We propose growing our leadership development programs to expand program access to more women and to draw from best practices across our three institutions. Focus areas will include male allyship and championship, expanding access to executive coaching, establishing deputizing and co-leading programs. We will design and deploy relevant training and create a repository of shared resources. We will address topics like bias and navigating the complexities of higher education, train women to serve on boards, focus on interdisciplinary collaboration, and train for effective leadership. By enhancing the recognition of distributed, distributed leadership, we will build capacity for change. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Kristen. Hi, Kristen. We can't see or hear you. Are you able to turn your mic on? And there you go. Hello? There you go. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the groups that have gone before. Your research and your recommendations are just so in line with our, uh, our groups that we're going forward here. I want to thank my co-lead, Dr. Di Bowman, our wonderful group of women that we've been working with, our student uh, leaders, and uh, our guest presenters. So today we're going to be talking about politics and policy and how timely uh, as we're going into this uh, season right now. So as one may know, no country in the world has closed the gender gap in the political empowerment and won't until 2115. That's 94 and a half years, even with a recent acceleration. Intersectional women face even greater marginalization. And over 95% of the country still have laws that discriminate against women in politics and policy. Next slide, please. So as our group really looked at this, we first wanted to look at, well, what were some of the barriers? And while there are many, these are just a few of the ones that really stuck out to us that we can start to, as we identify the barriers, we can start to identify opportunities and solutions to overcome them. So some of them being overt and covert include societal and cultural expectations, existing political apparatus, heightened harassment and aggression towards women in politics, and higher poverty rates and the lack of capital for women to actually put themselves in a situation where they are able to either become policymakers and or run for office themselves. 
Next slide, please. So what are some of the opportunities that come from this? We need to start looking at generating structural reform. More women in politics tends to raise the overall quality of candidates. Female politicians are more likely to advocate for policies that support education, health, sustainability, and gender equality. Quotas can increase women's political representation, but may still take around six years to close that gap. Next slide, please. So what are some of our aspirations? And these aspirations really are targeted towards government, universities, and industries as leaders in this space. So we've come up with four, knowing that there are many, many others that we can um, address as we go through this. One, accept responsibility for gender diversity. Two, demonstrate transparency and accountability. Three, establish fat pathways for women to even see themselves in this type of work. And in four, embrace diverse leadership. I'll go into some detail on those. So we need to, as we accept responsibility for gender diversity, we need to ensure the diversity and parity in decision-making arenas and dedication to gender diverse succession, promulgate responsibility for gender diversity and parity and intersectionality. We need to make sure that we're putting people in charge with ensuring responsibility. This cannot just go by the wayside. We cannot just give lip service to this. We need to put people making pledges and being specific on who is responsible for this and establishing specific quotas or targets. By doing this, this will ensure that there is someone taking responsibility for it and it is measurable. Next slide, please. Demonstrate transparency and accountability. Publicly demonstrate setting, advancing, and accomplishing gender and minority diversity goals and positive cultural changes. Again, we need to be able to track and publicize on equality metrics and goals. If we don't actually have the statistics in the database in front of us, we won't know where we're missing, where there are gaps, and where there are opportunities. And then with that development of a customized dashboard, and there are many out there, but let's Let's really take this data that can be um, that can be looked at in many different diverse uh, populations in different countries, if, whether it's city, state, local, national governments, whether it's in the corporate setting. So we want to be able to really look at this data and really find out where we have opportunities and where there are gaps. And then what are the consequences for noncompliance? We need to make sure that people are being held accountable. And if we say we're gonna do something, we're going to do it. Next slide, please. We need to establish pathways. We've heard a lot of talk about mentoring and having, um, being able to see yourself in these types of roles. Well, we need to establish substantive and demonstrable mentoring, training, and support programs for succession in women in leadership, including early education. We need to make sure that our girls, our young girls, K through eight, primary and elementary schools, understand what civic engagement is. What does that mean to be a policymaker? And how does that then lead to staying in policy, making policy that will change the landscape in which our future is living in, as well as running for office? And we need to help women. We need to train them on what it means to pursue public office and changing policy. What are the steps to take? How do they do it? What are the barriers and how do we help them overcome them? And enhance in existing leadership pathways for pro, um, programs through the PLUS Alliance. Perhaps there's a micro certification that we could develop out of our three amazing universities that could transcend all of our countries um, and into the world. Next slide, please. And fourth, we need to embrace diverse leadership. We need to recognize and promote the abilities and experiences, demonstrate expanded leadership roles in positions of influence for women and minorities. Leadership doesn't just look like one particular thing. There are so many qualities of leadership that come to the forefront. And it doesn't just look like one, there's not one particular attribute that means you're a leader. And how do we change the narrative of what leadership looks like? And we need to also work with our friends in the media to help us promulgate that, to make sure that we are 
putting our best foot forward and we're not holding people to different um, standards where leadership is leadership. And lastly, we'd like to just leave you with this. There is a moral imperative for equality. Universities must create opportunities for diverse leadership internally and must provide the infrastructure to enable external change. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. And Jenny, back to you and the panel. Thank you very much, Kristen and Christine and Erin. That was brilliant. And um, I think some pretty, pretty interesting um, insights, both into the sectors and um, some interesting and innovative thinking on what we should do to break through, which we'll explore with our next panel. So in this second panel, Erin is staying on the panel, but joining us is Dr. Tony Farmer-Thompson, co-lead of the Corporate Working Group, and Professor Diana Bowman, who is co-lead of the Politics and Policy Group. So just see if we can get you all up on screen. Oh, it's not seemed to be working for us. So I think what I should do is just um, go, go on and uh, talk. First of all, um, Tony, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, and I love the four Ps, by the way. That was fantastic uh, way to group this. I noticed in two of them, in preposition and positioning, recommendations, um, there is both um, refer to executive grit and indeed transforming personal grit into executive grit. I was wondering what you meant by executive, your group meant by executive grit and why this is something women need to develop it. Um, this, this question came up both from me and the audience, and I think behind it is just a question about, is this a gendered concept or is this something else that we mean? So if I could um, just throw to you to give us your thoughts on that. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy and pleased to be here and glad you asked that question because Executive Grid came out of research that Christine and I did, and it's in our book, Constitutional Grid. It comes from the work Angela Duckworth did. And many of you, most of us know who she is. She, she had a formidable career in a high level, a high level uh, position in a consulting firm. And she decided that what she would do is leave that practice and potential partnership and go and teach math in New York. And I think the Bronx, if I'm not mistaken. And she just wanted to make a difference. And while she's teaching math, what she realizes is it's not the smartest kids that make it. It's the kids with grit. And so we took that concept and said, you know, so it is with women. Every woman has grit. And what we did, we took our executive grit model and we did some research on how CEOs think and, and really what are the different differentiators in women making it from management to executive leadership. And we found that there are differences. Cognitive control, a failure resume where you're reflecting on what happened why it happened and you're imparting really kind of new techniques and tactics. It also said that uh, women and men in executive leadership spend their time differently. So we took the grit model and just put up against it executive grit. These are really the differentiated steps that move you from management to that C-suite level. Thank you very much, Tony. And um, it, the, the um, failure resume really resonates with me because I have a few of those myself. But um, certainly uh, one of the things that was taught to us early was um, that the best, one of the best ways to develop leaders is actually to stretch them outside their comfort zone in areas where they won't perfectly succeed all the time and do it often throughout their career because you became comfortable with learning from both success and failure. So I, I think that's 
that's a very, very interesting insight. Absolutely. Um, and if I may just throw something in, you, you have to learn for, from failures. And that is why they're finding entrepreneurs make great CEOs and great C-suite leaders. It is also the case that the concept of cognitive control is what women, you know, they say we're emotional, right? And so the research said that um, people that make it to that highest level, Aaron, they have cognitive control. They 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 manage their responses. So just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> and 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 incredibly important because you're um, on 24 hours, seven days a week when you're a leader, aren't you? It's all visible, and um, people pick up and learn a great deal and react a great deal to what you say. Thank you very much, Tony. Can I move on to Erin now? Um, Repaying, reimagining, and rebalancing three R's <laughs> service. I thought that was brilliant. Um, and what we're really talking about here is um, enhancing the impact by your soft skills. The, I think the real challenge. It's a really, it's it's a very important idea, and it's very important to be recognised. But it has an amplification effect on what you do. Incredibly difficult. I've always found to quantify it in a way that fits in with with metrics in an organization because it enhances rather than it's a solely a thing in itself. So um, obviously one of the most important things is what you do around pay and promotions. How did your plan, ha your group have any thought about how you would take it into account in pay and promotion? Is there any tips on, on how you could actually make that work in practice? Sure, we did. Uh, yes, and I would I would say that reframing in part is a transition from what are previously thought of as uh, soft skills to uh, viewing them as more power skills and the skills that are complementary to the other parts of of the job and the role that you have at the institution. Um, so yes, currently there are uh, different ratios by which each person, whether they are faculty staff. Uh, or uh, an administrator are measured for promotion. And I think uh, the rebalancing piece is making sure that they are equally weighted so that uh, as someone goes up, whether it's for promotion or tenure or for promotion, if they hold a different part of uh, a different role in the university, um, that those power skills and the work that they do really to build community, to uh, relationship build both with students and with coworkers and with the community more broadly, that that really is taken into deep consideration because of the real impact that it has on ROI for the institution uh, and the ability that it or the, the role that it plays in long term sustainability. So it really is a rethinking and a reframing and the rebalancing piece is that as it relates to waiting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, I'd like to ask Diana a question now. Um, you recommend introducing consequences for not complying with your principle two, your working group does, and that principle is around demonstrating transparency and accountability. This is one I think we've been all recommending for a long time. We know that shining a light really makes a difference, but what, um, uh, what would be the consequences that would encourage um, organizations and leaders to demonstrate transparency and accountability because we've all been saying it a lot um, and we haven't been getting the traction. Has your working group given any thought to how you could reinforce it with some consequences, both rewards and, and, and negative ones? Emily, I would take a step back first and look at the issue of accountability and transparency in addressing that question. That in order to hold to account, we actually need to have the metrics in front of us. And yes, we do have dash dashboards that report on the number of women who are in leadership positions as heads of state or at a county level. But when we drill down to those statistics, do they actually report on women of color, women with disabilities, women who are not binary in terms of their gender preferences? We do not have that data. So before we can even talk about what compliance would look like or consequences for compliance, we need to have a lot more knowledge about what the state of affairs are. And that means actually going backwards and thinking about really what is important when we talk about diversity and equity 
and making sure that everybody is actually represented in that room, not just women and men in terms of our traditional forms. Once we have that worked out, then I think that's when we can start to think about what do consequences look like. But we are not at that point. We need to actually go back and get our metrics in order and be able to report on those first. Thanks, thanks, Diana. And um, I think um, it's a timely um, call for a much richer data set because data exploitation has become incredibly more sophisticated and cheaper and easier to do. So it kind of ties in with where we're going with the digital economy, doesn't it? But um, as I said, being a pragmatic tax collector person, I always want to know how you nail down changing that behaviour as well. So that's one I think we, we need to keep working on and, and, and get set, started on some different ways of doing it. Um, can I go back to you, Erin? Um, I always love um, international exchanges and communities of practice. I think it's, and, and part of that's probably being Australian, it's been enormously important for us to be able to engage in the world in various ways, even if it's at breakfast. Um, but <laughs> what, what I'd like to just explore with you a little bit, I can see how a community of practice uh, can be tremendously valuable for that community of practice. But how do we translate that into impact? Did your group have any thoughts on, on that about, you know, how it, it could um, have a broader impact uh, beyond its, it, the group itself? Sure. Uh, and I, I think the group, one of the things that we articulated was our growth model and the ability to continuously add members uh, and to expand beyond our three institutions to be really transformative as it relates to women's leadership in higher education. Um, so the impact in part comes from there, but also the idea that we will work collaboratively to develop resources and that we have a throughput from uh, the earliest part of the academic journey all the way into the workforce. And we leverage the things like Dai's been talking about and what Tony was talking about to inform the, the, the way that we operate. Uh, so I think part of it is community building. Part of it is just making sure that, that people who have aspirations to be leaders or who have demonstrated a desire uh, to participate in the community building, that they have this kind of opportunity to do so. And that also by creating this in an international space, we lead to potentially groundbreaking collaborative research. But we expose people to uh, a perspective or perspectives that they might not have had. And that alone makes people who are members more competitive. It increases uh, the kind of diversity to which they're exposed. Uh, it contributes from an impact perspective on so many levels. So I, th I think your, your question is good. And I think from, from the way that it was ideated, uh, the hope is that in all of the activity, whether it's the, the mentoring uh, or uh, some other thing that's born out of being part of uh, the actual community of practice, that it translates uh, and is uh, translates to action that continuously occurs. And I want to say we we were forward thinking in this, and we actually have our first uh, inaugural event, which is uh, a tri university trailblazing women's leadership workshop to talk about the complexities of higher education for women who are interested in leadership. Uh, so we we have something planned where we will open up the work that was begun by our working group to uh, the networks that are already operational at each of our institutions and who we know would be uh, so interested in participating in something like this. So, so we're very excited uh, and we hope the in impact stems from, uh, you know, where we began and continues all the way through uh, in perpetuity. That's fantastic. It's really fantastic that you're already breathing life into this. Congratulations. I'm going to do something ambitious on this last question. I'm going to start with Diana and then ask Tony to comment. So we'll see how we go. I was really interested. Um, we're, we're getting a number of recommendations already from you about um, how we play with the role of leadership. And I noticed in your recommendations under Embrace Diverse Leadership, Diana, you're talking about incentivizing co-roles. Um, so I'm interested, so we've got job sharing, we've got vertical job sharing. What is, what is a co-role and um, why would, um, 
what what incentives did you have in mind to develop those? And then I'd like Tony to concept from uh, to comment from her framework of leadership about how this would fit in with um, the development she thinks leaders need around developing executive grit and um, being able to play into that model. So if I could start with you, Diana. Certainly. So I think we are using the same different terms to describe the same thing. So when we were talking about co-roles, it was to having a one role with multiple people, um, generally two, sharing the responsibilities and duties. And that would be a pathway to bring women up into those leadership positions in a quicker way. Um, and definitely giving experience and opportunities um, to women who wish to actually pursue those pathways. And, and Diana, I completely agree. Uh, if you take a look at the concept of succession planning, uh, what we talked about was succession planning 2.0. I mean, back, mm, I would say 30 years ago, when Chris and I worked at the bank together, maybe 28 years ago, we worked at uh, Bank One Downtown Phoenix together. And a large project that we conducted was doing uh, succession planning throughout the organization. But what we believe we should do is an intentional algorithm where we know what it takes for a woman to get to the top from a skill perspective, from actual jobs. Uh, so you got PL experience, you got to have sales experience depending on the industry. And so you create that path or that algorithm so that it's more predictive that they make it, right? And you, you supplement that with soft skills. And on the corporate or the demand side, you compensate managers for actually getting that diversity at the higher level with the women. Did you execute on the plan to bring in a more diverse workforce? And are you promoting women? You get a bonus or you don't. Thank, thank you very much. And um, I think that might be a, an interesting one in the detail about how the bonus might be shared if we have a number of people sharing a role and um, would be a good, I think, test of our collaboration skills, depending on how we work that out. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tony, Diana and Erin for being our second panel. That was incredibly interesting. And now for our final group of presentations, we've got three more for you, the arts, entrepreneurship and innovation and media and communications. And you know the drill now, uh, we would love to have some more questions for you. So please pop them into the window when Lily opens them and we will ask as many as we can. So in this round, we are going to try something slightly different for one of our presentations for entrepreneurship and innovations, where two we actually have two presenters, and they are our fabulous student ambassadors, who, as you know, have been full members of your working groups, but they've also been helping us behind the scenes, um, supporting leads for working groups and working closely with Lily. So it's great to have two of them in this next round. Anyway, so let's get started. Here is Sonia Maddock, who is co-lead of the Arts Working Group, and she's going to present their recommendations on what it will take. Over to you, Sonia. Thank you, Jenny. I'm Sonia Maddock, co-lead of the Arts Working Group with my UNSW colleague and Senior Curator of Art, Eleanor Taylor. And to the next slide, please. The arts is a diverse and highly visible industry. The creative and cultural sector encompasses theatre, dance, music, visual art, craft, design, screen, radio, literature, and all its many intersections. The 2014 UNESCO report, Gender Equality, Heritage and Creativity, explicitly identifies culture as a key human right and the enabler for all people to develop to their full potential. It showed that women have been particularly marginalised from cultural life and face numerous barriers to equally access, contribute to and participate in arts and culture. Women are generally well represented throughout the sector and are the biggest consumers of culture, but the representation of women in decision making roles does not reflect 
the high rate of participation, nor the diversity of the population. And the bigger the budget, the more likely there is a white man at the top. There is a perception that we are fortunate to work in the arts, that we're doing it for love, an assumption which has led to systemic poor remuneration and job security, combined with high expectations, long and irregular working hours, and uncertain career paths from beginning to end. The pandemic has had a compounding effect on women with substantial job losses and cultural program reductions right across the industry. To the next slide, please. Moving on to our aspirations, we identified three codependent types of arts leadership. Artistic, which is leadership in artistic practice. Creative, those industries that support uh, creative and cultural activities. And cultural, which are the overarching value of the arts and creativity to societal culture. We decided to dream big in shaping the future for the next generation. We agreed that it was critical to develop new leadership models that are ethical, collaborative and consultative, fundamentally human centred and community focused. We need to develop new approaches to support, training and education that are inclusive of multiple intersectionalities to clear and broaden women's paths to leadership from school all the way through to industry leaders. And we need to make sure that women are at the table their contribution to the sector is acknowledged and that this is used to drive the narrative of the societal contribution and economic value of the creative and cultural sector. The next slide, please. So among the key recommendations for the Arts Working Group are establishing, reporting and embedding of universal standards. As an example, we recommend setting up a transparent, universal reporting structure for arts organisations to be ranked on criteria of meeting gender parity at all levels. This also means KPIs for all senior staff and mandatory recurrent unconscious bias training for everyone. We recommend new collaborative decision making models, as well as mentoring, fellowships and scholarships, actions including adopting work life balance strategies in project planning, counting and recognising out of hours work, co-location and provision of childcare support for out of hours work, and implementation of vertical job share and flexible work arrangements. And lastly, our campaign of positivity. We look forward to our industry having women's leadership champions, celebrating stories of diverse leaders and their impact on the arts and as a positive societal influence. We recommend that universities implement undergraduate program requirements in the arts and in gender studies. And lastly, it is normal practice for arts boards to include representatives of a broad range of professions and industries and almost unheard of for arts leaders to be included on business and industry boards. We put out a challenge for all other industries to include women arts leaders on their boards and to benefit from the skills perspectives and creativity that they would bring. Thank you to our fantastic working group, including our student ambassadors, Mika and Diana, whose leadership pathway we hope is barrier free. I now pass to Alexandra Eagle and Sneha Pujani of the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Working Group. Hello, um, I'm gonna start, I'm Alexandra. Um, and I'm one of the student ambassadors for the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Working Group. Um, could I have the slideshow, please, put up? Thank you. Next slide. Thanks. So our group's theory of change is that if individuals examine our own levels of privilege, that can be transformative in changing the behaviors and mindset and existing systems that are currently holding back women entrepreneurs and innovators. So with that in mind, our fundamental recommendation is that similar to the ways that um, Australians begin meetings and important gatherings with an acknowledgement of country, we would ask that uh, meetings of leaders and decision makers in this field start with an acknowledgement of who is and who is not at the table. We think that centering diversity and inclusion at the beginning of a meeting can go really far in changing the industry. Um, next slide, please. We're gonna talk about a few specific recommendations. 
And I do want to echo what some other presenters have said about um, transparency, sanctions, and accountability measures. Our group consistently came back to the idea that those need to be in place for any of these goals to actually work. So one of the problematic behaviors that our group talked about a lot was skewed storytelling. The narrative in uh, entrepreneurship and innovation often centers men. So we would propose that narratives in the media, company coverage, um, particularly um, cover underrepresented women and women in general. Um, and similarly, uh, we would like to see diversity in education and training. Uh, we would love to see girls learning skills like risk taking and failure so that not only they have visible mentors um, through media coverage, but they also have the skills necessary to follow those paths that they see. Um, Sneha, over to you. Thank you, Alexandra. Next slide, please. Great. One valuable recommendation that came up was the need for change in mindset. People in privileged positions should actively sponsor women's backgrounds across all levels of leadership. Leadership positions should have at least two potential successes, 50% of which should be women. The groups before us spoke about the broken pipeline. A change in mindset is how we can fix that broken pipeline. Next, please. Thank you. Our working group wanted to ensure that we apply lens of intersectionality and dimensionality in everything that we think about. We, that we, we come from privileged backgrounds ourselves. Our recommendation that we came up with is to have job sharing, to, uh, to have flexible work across all roles in the white collar sector, in the blue collar sector, and wherever possible. Track the increase in women and the retention across all the roles. We also recognize that the systems we work in were not designed with women in mind. To that effect, we recommend redesigning of degrees, jobs, and career paths in order to make them more equitable and accessible for women. We believe these recommendations will bring the theory of change to life. And with that, we will realize the aspiration that by 2030, we will live in a world where society believes and values the businesses and innovations created by women as deeply as they value the ones that are created by men. We believe that with these changes, we'll live in a world where businesses are as diverse in leadership as the company they serve in, and a world where funding opportunities flow freely for women and women have a strong network of allies. That concludes our very brief summary of the action plans. Thank you so much, and especially thank you for the panel to allow the student ambassadors to take the lead here. It has been great. With that, I hand it over to Susan. Thank you, Alexandria and Sneha. And also, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for this important event. An eight-hour think tank, three continents, done virtually. You did it. We know there were countless hours that involved this, and, uh, and it's paid off. I'd also uh, like to express my gratitude to my fantastic team, committed, passionate, engaged. We had five drop-in guests from all ranks in the pipeline, young women just starting out, women who had achieved the C-suite, a former uh, uh, personal assistant to Harvey Weinstein. They gave us great insight to what's happening in media and communications. We had a great critical friend and a fantastic co-leader, Jackie Petchel. Truly, truly a team effort. So let's give you a quick context of media and communications. Seb, if you can go to the next screen. Women are actually well represented in entry and mid-level management roles, according to McKinsey's 2019 Women in the Workplace Study. Yet when it comes to top leadership, women hold only 27% of the C-suite. And this has dual consequences because media plays a critical role in how women are perceived globally, think about it, top management, top managers are the ones that determine whether a story gets covered, how it gets covered, the language that's used in these stories. And the gender imbalance is, is especially in evident in how women are portrayed in entertainment. Most studio executives are men, and so this can reinforce the negative and disparaging stereotypes for women. Seb, if we can go to the next screen. So our vision statement is simply this. It's good business 
to have women as top managers. They are a key customer component in media and communications. We are voracious consumers of media and communications. And also there's an obligation for an industry whose task is to inform the public to employ best practices itself on equal pay and job parity. So this kind of progress that we would see in this industry could spur action elsewhere because of the huge influence the media, communications, and entertainment industries play in society. It is imperative and it is possible to achieve this quality, this equality by 2030. If we can go to the next screen, thanks, Seb. So we boiled it down. We had lots of recommendations, but we boiled it down to industry, academia, and government, and lots of different uh, principles and supporting actions, but just this for the highlights. So industry should commit to publishing a public declaration on actions that will be taken to improve gender equality for the benefit of those inside and outside the sector. And like so many of the women who have spoken before us, um, this should include data, publishing data on gender pay and promotions. If we can go to the next screen, academia. Academia should create the mentoring and evaluation of the performance via a gender responsibility index that reports on the gender equality performance of media, communications, and entertainment organizations. This should be co-designed with government and industry support, and this should be be measured against national and international benchmarks that include gender ratios in senior leadership roles and board positions. Before we go to the next screen, I just want to say that Think about how companies and organizations love to promote themselves. This would be a very credible index, and they could very justly brag about themselves. So we could have them naming, but also shaming those that are laggards. And there you would have this index that would have all the data to support it. And finally, let's go to government. So the government has a key role here, too, to promote and facilitate partnerships and collaborations between government, industry, and academia aimed at overcoming barriers to women reaching their full leadership potential. And of course, it doesn't stop there. I mean, we also have ideas on educational opportunities, on mentoring, on retention and recruitment, on capital investment. That will be in our in our written uh, publication, but those are just a few of the things that my fantastic team came up with. And with that, I'll toss it back to Jenny. Thank you so much, Susan. That was brilliant and uh, ends us on a very high and creative note. And I'm going to come back to your gender responsibility index with the panel. I thought that was a very interesting idea. So. Uh, that was our final presentations. Thank you, Sonia, Alexandra, Sneha, and Susan. For, that was all brilliant. And we have a complete changeover for this last panel. We've got um, the other co-leads. So I am joined by Eleanor Taylor, co-lead for arts, Dr. Marguerite evans galea for entrepreneurship and innovation, and Professor Jackie Petchell for uh, media and communications. So welcome, Eleanor, Marguerite, and Jackie. And Eleanor, I'd like to go to you first. Um, the the impact of, on the sector of COVID and the economic fallout from it has been enormous, disproportionately high, as your plan um, points out, and ongoing. Um, there's also, and I've benefited from it, been some really entrepreneurial and creative responses to finding ways to connect with us virtually, the virtual um, galleries, um, music, a whole range of those things, not just the traditional things we're used to seeing um, through technology. But my question for you is, is that a fundamental change for the sector um, or do you envisage it'll go backwards? And will it work to the detriment or the benefit of women in the pathway? It's a very interesting question and it's probably um, not completely clear, but I think all indications show that it is absolutely devastating upon the industry and particularly 
upon certain sectors of the industry more so than others. So live entertainment is is clearly um, going to be the hardest hit by the pandemic. Um, I think uh, a recent survey in America showed that there's been 95% of events have been cancelled, um, a 30% reduction of the artistic workforce, a 24% reduction of staff, and really that 67% of businesses expect or industries expect this to have an absolutely significant impact upon upon their uh, on on their business. So so the impact is devastating. The government response overall hasn't been um, particularly uh, focused upon upon the pandemic and on, on the arts. So in Australia, we've had much more of a sort of a hard hat response, uh, not really looking at at our sector, and considering the enormous um, even just the econ economic benefit of our sector. Um, in terms of what arts organisations have done, you're quite right. There's been a huge response in terms of changing methods of delivering um, arts, cultural programs to people, um, basically using the internet. And what we've also seen is, you know, the ability of arts to strengthen com community cohesion, to raise morale, and really just to help people manage the, the difficulties that, that COVID has brought up. So the opportunity has been that the pandemic has... Um, I think underlined the importance of arts and culture within society, and and that's very evident. And then conversely, it, it's almost been one of the hardest hit sectors. I think there will be new ways of working, absolutely, within the arts, and new ways of delivering um, art experiences for people, and and the creativity that's been shown is is wonderful, and the accessibility that that's increased for uh, the arts across all sorts of people in remote locations and so forth. I think will will continue. So yes, the arts are always resilient. They're always creative, and they will continue to um, grow. But um, we are suffering, and of course, it's women in the industry because we have so many women working in the creative and cultural sector who we know are going to be affected the most. Thank you very much, Eleanor. And um, just to uh, to add a little bit to that. Um, one of the things that um, in the industries I'm associated with, we have been um, theorising on is that working from home in some ways does advantage women because it allows more flexibility around the home, but obviously disadvantages as well if they're disproportionately doing work. But the observation we're making, particularly around professional um, sectors, is that men are coming back into the office more quickly than women, and as a result, are more visible and getting more of the interesting work. So um, it's interesting. I, I suspect there are bigger transformations to the arts sector, but there's also sort of small things to consider and think about in terms of what it means for visibility and how things work. I think we have a, a lot of um, reframing to do about the long-term impacts of COVID for all of us. Um, I'd like to turn now to Marguerite. Um, and um, I've got to say, I really love the diversity acknowledgement. What a clever idea. Just have it in um, the forefront of every single meeting that you're in, that you have that awareness around the room. But I'm wondering um, whether you have thought about whether it should go further than being an awareness raising, educating kind of tool. Um, do you, and you, you'll know I keep harping on about this, do you, um, do you have envisioned and discussed should there be consequences if you continue to have imbalances in that room, you know, because I can see a room full of blokes just saying to each other, oh, there's no women present. Every single meeting may not be enough in itself. Um, so, you know, things like should it be recorded in the minutes? Should it be put in annual reports? Was there any thought about um, that you might actually build on the idea or would that actually undermine it? I think that's a really good point, Jenny, and I, I do believe we discussed that as a group because our group, I, I wish we could have put everything that's in our action plan onto the slides and, and the depth of the discussion was really important. I guess I just want to first acknowledge um, Raji 
and B. Karaja, who was the chair of our co-working group. Uh, just a fantastic leader, uh, a woman of colour who brought a lot, a lot to the discussion. And also as a group of primarily white women, we ourselves held ourselves accountable. And that's why we felt this intersectional inclusive approach and having that discussion at every single meeting was really, really important because we ourselves felt that we were white woman dominated and that we weren't necessarily the perfect group to address every single aspect of intersectionality. And so that was something that we we also felt was important that organisations do and that decision making committees do. Um, our critical friend Jennifer Westercott uh, told us a fantastic story that was literally incredible to hear because it was one of those things where a woman submitted a business plan to a finance organization for review, an, an early stage entrepreneur, and it, she found out it wasn't even looked at. Um, and so who made that decision? Who really thought about that? Um, and so I think it's really critical that we do hold ourselves accountable as organizations. And I believe some of the programs, we, we tried not to, as a group, focus too much on individual countries programs, such as Australia's Mal Champions of Change or the Athena Swan. However, these these, these kinds of programs allow us to hold ourselves accountable, allow us to have transparency around that. And I think it just takes a few bold organisations to take the lead and, and to put it out there and start good practice. And I think that will shift shift the dial there. I think it's also really important that we make women aware of this as we go through with a constant, you know, that evaluation of our own privilege. We don't do it enough. Um, even as as leaders, as as female leaders, we don't do it enough. I know there's a, a power and privilege wheel that you can look at all the different aspects of intersectionality and you can evaluate your own privilege in the context of those. And then you realise, I can actually be an ally for so many other women, you know, and, and that in and of itself allows you then to, to create a sponsorship and mentoring program for other women who will be different to you. And so that was another recommendation that we had. We felt that, you know, white female entrepreneurs who are really successful can reach out to those who are perhaps from marginalised groups and help to bring them through. And so, you know, you saw Lexi and Sneha uh, presenting our slides today. We felt it was really important as a group to, to bring young women through. And part of that is to give them visibility. Um, you know, if we have more young people coming through who we can see as future leaders and future role models, that's inspiring to, to kids at school, you know, and that encourages them to em embrace the risk-taking and failure mindset that's critical to entrepreneurship. So I think we did cover a lot of those different discussions, and I think you're absolutely right that we need to have greater transparency and accountability around these things. Thank you, Marguerite. And I, I wonder um, if um, there's actually a crossover into media and communications, perhaps in the gender Absolutely. responsibility index, we might want to um, recognise, because I think they're very clever about try creating competition to be the best is, is often a great incentive. Perhaps there's one for the most sophisticated um, and insightful acknowledgement at a meeting. Because I was kind of, you know, just a little bit playfully thinking, you could have a prize night, couldn't you? A bit like the Academy Awards and the BAFTAs in, in the UK to recognise the best. And it'd be a fantastic opportunity to do a little bit of shaming as well. QUT <laughs> actually does that, Jenny. So I encourage Science? you to do it. Um, QUT has a quiet achievers night. So those, those small actions that boost others. So I encourage you to do it. Quiet achievers, I really like that. That is fantastic. Thank you. Um, I want to move now to Jackie and um, the media and communications plan. Um, your third recommendation was around government leading collaboration with industry and academics to overcome barriers for women reaching their leadership potential. And um, Susan really, I think, um, nailed it for us to say, look, only 27% of the top leaders in, um, in media and communications are women. And this is not just about an industry. This is about one of the most 
influential things in the lives of all of us. So it's tremendously important um, that we break through on this and, and it's going to be quite a challenge. But my question for you, Jackie, was um, in overcoming the barriers, do you want to set them at a, a particular target? Is there a key barrier that you think is the important one to be knocked over first? Because sometimes, you know, um, you get further by saying, look, fix this one first, rather than how do we actually move everything? Is there a key one or two? Oh, have we lost Jackie? Jackie, can you turn your mic? Yeah, I'm good. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I think a really core aspect of the question you're asking is where does all this start? And all of this starts actually is when um, men and young women are deciding their career paths, right? And so without bragging too much on the Walter Cronkite School, I will say that the school has... Uh, of journalism and mass communication, um, has many professional programs, many of which, the majority of which, are led by women. And all of these women, like Susan and myself and Kristen Gilger and our dean, and I could go on and on and on, are, are all former professional uh, journalists. And so, at, so if you look at students as the youngest version of the next generation, I think that one of the the most important things you can do, especially in higher education and in the media, is to empower them to feel that they deserve the right to have positions that matter. And, um, and I think we do that very well there, just based on role models and, um, and, and the fact that our basically our program participants are, if I hope I'm right about this, um, still is predominantly female. So I think that's one way to do it. The other is, is that um, many of us who are now teaching journalism are also, because we were professionals, have a lot of influence with people who are still in the media. And so um, often, uh, I know this to be the case for me, I know it to be the case for Kristen, I know it the case to be for Susan, is that we often go to bat for candidates, assuming of course that they're the best candidate, um, who will provide a different voice, um, a female voice. It may be a young woman who, um, you know, a woman of color for sure. Um, so I think that the biggest role that we can play in the media and communications is to continue to have a network of female leaders, not just at the university level, but across the board, who take it upon themselves to mentor others to take their place and who take it upon themselves to create others of the best part of ourselves. Now, we're not all, we all don't, aren't perfect, but if we teach our own attributes about uh, leadership um, and, um, you know, integrity and why what we do is very important. Um, I think that we can inspire as mentors that what I hope will be an army of women and young women um, who succeed. And, and I know that we have been um, successful at that. Um, all, Kristen and I both have uh, daughters who are not that you know, who are close in age and both of our daughters are successful. And I would say that part of that is because we push them as we would um, students or other journalists and uh, to be the best they could. And the same was true in mentoring young women in newsrooms. I'm sure Susan can speak to that as well, that one of the most important things we do is when you're in a newsroom is to um, push not only for your own success, but to show the integrity to also push for the success of other young women who you hope, if you've done a good job, will become like you and will have the successes you've had. And so I really think that mentorship and, and um, support is one of the most important things in a course education, which is what we do at a university. Um, and I think that those things would improve drastically. But as I said, we're also um, 
we have a very strong, powerful female um, cohort in leadership and in important positions at the school. And, and I think we see that impact when we see a lot of the young women get great jobs. And then we have some, I've been there long enough to follow some women who have gone into then the next great job who are our students. So I think the key is um, support and believing in each other. Um, and especially in some media environments where there's often a lot of undercutting, I think it's really important to, and probably in lots of industries, I think it's important that we embrace ourselves first as women who deserve to succeed as opposed to, I need to be the one to succeed. Thank you, Jackie. And um, I, I think um, it's slightly underselling yourself too, because what they're seeing is a demonstration of how you can succeed when they're interacting with you. Which yes, is yes. Perhaps one of the things we could encourage in um, government leading that charge is how do we get that to work more consistently? Because um, everyone recommends more mentoring, more sponsorship. Uh, the reality is some are better than others, some get more traction than others. And um, so there, there's a trick to that that needs to be unpacked about how we make and that really impactful. I, I would agree because, you know, newsrooms, as I said, are particularly um, fluid and, and a lot of emotion is running depending on whatever story everybody is covering. And, and I think that sometimes the instinct is to, look, you just got to get it done. You just got to go back to your desk, young lady, and get it done. You know, instead of saying, here's what I would do. This is what I would do if I was faced with the challenge you're facing. I know you don't want to go cover this protest. And I know, you know, you had something else you were going to do, but this is the right thing to do for you. It will help your career. And um, I learned a lot of that as an investigations editor uh, for multiple publications and TV stations over the years. And but I learned the best of it while being where I am now, which is where we are very much empowered to make sure that all students but, you know, in this instance, that women have their rightful place in leadership positions and important um, communications positions. Thanks, Jackie. Can I add one thing to that, Jenny? Because I, yes. I think that's a really important point. Um, mentoring and sponsorship does work for women. But we, we should also remember and, and continue to reiterate that the system currently has been created created by a white male leadership. Um, and so when, you know, what, what works within that system might work more for white women. It might work for more for those with executive grit simply because they, they look like white male leaders in that space. So our behaviours, if we role model male behaviour, if we um, look very much like them, uh, it's easier to get to the top. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. That's why we're here. But it's easier. And so we must constantly remember that what we're, what's working now in the current system may not work for every single woman, particularly sure. those on marginalised groups. Yes. And, and I think that's that should be part of the challenge. It's a really good point. Um, and... Yes, so I, I think I'll leave it there because if I'm quick, I can squeeze in one more question, which I'd like all of you to comment on, but I think to um, Jackie first, and it's a bit cheeky because it came through late and it was for the a politics. Bit cheeky. <laughs> I love that. That made my day. But I think it applies to all of you because this theme about um, campaigning has um, been in all of them. Um, so let me give you the question. How do we influence the media to profile more diverse leaders and call them out on how they represent, in this case, women political leaders? But a number of you have said we need to find ways that was what the recognition loop of how, how we celebrate. But how, how do we do that? Um, and I would add, how do we do that authentically? Because um, even though Visuals where we show diverse sets of images are great. They often look false very quickly for some of the points Marguerite has been making about, you know, what what's um, what's a great image for some doesn't work for others, etc. But um, are there some tips first of all from the media um, and and communications ones about how we would do that? And then if I could go to Marguerite, then Eleanor for comments. 
When you say that, you mean how we could influence the media to do that, to be more? To be more, yes, more diverse leaders, obviously more diverse women leaders. Um, yeah, that that's a really good question, and it's it's a a, a cheeky question, actually. <laughs> I love that word. It is <laughs> because because it's 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 hard. It's so hard to say because there's a difference between. Um, you know, forcing your way into something and getting your way. And, and there's always a fine path to walk in every company, but I think it's very prolific in media companies to sort of um, attain all the goals that you want to attain. And so I'd be interested in what Susan has to say about that. She really worked, you know, I mean, if you want to talk about sort of the real cutthroat business of of everything. It's a lot of it's in television, which Susan yeah. led led a lot of her career in. Um, not oh, to say she's, Susan. She's still that, here. So do you, do you want to pop her on, Jackie? <laughs> what? Do you do Susan? you want to, do you want to ask her to pop in? Yes, I would like to opinion here. on that. <laughs> Susan and I, by the way, are also like very dear friends. So it just is. It was a, a Kristen made a. Um, wonderful choice in putting us together because we get on the phone and we wrap it up in like 15 minutes. This is what we're going to do. So she'll have a good, better answer than me probably. And Susan, if I can just give you a lead in, uh, one of the things they always gave me in media training is if you want to, um, if you want to get a story out, you have to be either, uh, desirably both interesting and funny. <laughs> it's the best way to get things into the media. But what what's your advice on how, how we get um, if I read you back the question, how do we influence the media to profile more diverse leaders and call them out? Also, there's a call them out on how they represent women political leaders. So I reckon that might go in the index, the naming and shaming side of things. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what's the tips? Because it's well, a two-way thing. It's not just about media, is it? No, but, but the media covers these stories. And one yeah. of the big stories, and a, a lot of the co-leads or leads mention this, is Me Too. It's about inclusion. And so imagine the hypocrisy if all you have is women presented in a certain way on your network. Um, I can think of one specific network, um, which is quite infamous in the US, but it's part of a global empire. And um, some of my friends uh, who work there told me that they when they were on air, they could only be wearing skirts and dresses. Um, pants were just a, a, a no-go. And in television in particular, you do sign a contract that the, the company owns your image. That's standard for men or women. But when the image is so narrowly defined, um, like that particular network, um, that is not helping women. Um, women don't run around, can't run around. You can't run and, and cover protests or fires in six inch heels. They look great if you're standing on the red carpet. That's about their usefulness. So I do think just to get to the point, because um, I know that you have other fantastic people on this panel, is that the news cycle itself, Me Too has been tremendously important in casting a harsh light on industries and areas that are lagging, including the media, including the media business. You need to hear, you need to hear from women, you need to let women lead. Um, they're, they're, they're a huge part of the, of the business and you need to get close to your customers. That's true of almost any business. And, Thanks. and, I, and I would add, we, oh, sorry, we need to make sure that we are imp also empowering women but if you have the source of, if you have two choices between two people to interview and they are equal, but one is always in the media, which is the man, and one is seldom in the media, which is a woman, then we should go to the woman. So that it's not, it's also our selection of the things we choose to cover and the people we choose to cover, which is another very powerful component of the media. And I think that's exactly what they're trying to get at is how do we get. Yeah. Um, how do we get that choice to be women more often? And and I guess my challenge back would be, you've also um, got to create the interesting story for the media. And I don't mean that in an artificial sense, but think about what it is that they, you know, an audience is going to relate to. 
Um, but Marguerite, because you're nodding away, um, I know everyone else. I am, because I agree with everything that's been said so far. But I also think there are a couple of barriers that we can overcome that have, um, you know, a, a couple of ways to do it is, one, we need to introduce women into media in a very positive way. I think when a woman has a media experience that is negative in any kind of way, it immediately puts her off. That's one thing I would say. And I think it could be true for anyone. But I, I know a lot of women in STEM through my network who have had a media experience that they didn't feel was positive for them. And so they've backed away from it rather than step forward again. So, so organisations can train people better and, and groups like the ABC have initiatives in place where they have this goal of putting more women into not only their TV but also into their newspaper quotes, their radio interviews. And so they've actively created a database yeah. of women experts and women leaders and they've reached out to every women in something network uh, including, you know, many of the women in STEM networks that I'm affiliated with, they have reached out to them actively and said, can you please give us some recommendations of leaders we can reach out to? And they have created that resource for themselves and, and have definitely, I felt like, increased visibility of women in STEM. But there's also the gatekeepers. Uh, we have a lot of gatekeepers at organisations, um, not just, you know, affiliated with PR teams, public relations teams, but also just, you know, heads of department, who, who decides who steps forward, who's the most worthy story to be told. I think as, as organisations, we should hold ourselves accountable and say, well, you know, are we gatekeeping? Are we holding women's stories back? Are we, are we skewing our own storytelling? And so I think that's something that can also shift. Um, and increase the visibility of, of the women in your organisation as a way to, to flagship your organisation. You know, this is an incredible way to, to increase the visibility of the, your, your own organisation's work. Why wouldn't you do it? So I, I think there's a couple of different ways we can think about it. Mm -hmm. Elena, any comments to add? Yeah, I, I think this is a really interesting area. Visibility is the key. Calling out the problem is exactly what's needed everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think activism is something that we've seen in the visual arts particularly, and we, we have the um, example in the 80s of the Guerrilla Girls campaign that really called out the absolute inequities in the visual arts, and, and that has been hugely successful in that area. And as was mentioned, the Me Too movement. And it's not just Me Too. I mean, the great thing about this is we, of course, now have social media that goes beyond traditional media, and the activism that's happening on social media, and I see it in my field at the moment with several campaigns, Change the Museum is one, Visibility of Salary Transparencies is another. I mean, look at the Oscars, um, Oscars So White, and, and what that has actually achieved. So I think what we're going to see more is, is the ability to get out messages and call out uh, through non-traditional media, in fact, and, and grassroots activism that will be coming Absolutely. up from... from there rather than being necessarily led by ourselves, people in institutions or the media. It, it, it's coming and, and we're all going to uh, see the impact of that. And that's, that's a very good point um, to think beyond um, traditional media and media coverage. And if I may say so myself, um, that's the final question for this panel. Um, I think all of you and indeed all of our presenters and panellists are illustrating the very interesting things that women can be and do, uh, which is part of this, it's, it's not just about calling things out. It's also about um, why it's inspiring and fantastic to be a woman and what they can do as well. So um, I'd like to, on that note, thank our panel, Eleanor, Marguerite thank and you. Jackie, and Susan for jumping in when we needed her. Much, much appreciated. Um, just one last reflection from me on um, what you've heard this morning, and I'm sure there'll be many you'll all think about. Um, really did expect and delivered some very practical um, actions, um, insightful ones about how we might um, move the dial on this challenge. But what also struck me is some very some creativity and innovation in both the recommendations but also the language. I really liked um, not just that they were innovative but um, 
using language in a different way that also reframes. And if I just play back to you some of the ones I heard, recognition loops, failure re resumes, power skills, algorithm, I'm not sure if I can even say this because I'm not sure how it is to do, but alg algorithmically and analyzing the career pathway, campaigns of positivity, diversity acknowledgement, gender responsibility index, although I'm going to have to just do my thing about just making sure those that acronym doesn't do something naughty that we haven't thought about, which is <laughs> those kinds of things. But look, thank you very much. Uh, you have done an amazing um, uh, coverage in just over two hours. That's really incredible. And it's been very thoughtful and it showcased um, some very innovative thinking. So thank you very much. And for our audience, if any of you have, like me, some reflections or some feedback that you want to pass on to it, post it and Lily will catch it at the other end because we'd really like to know if there's if this has sparked any thoughts for you or any reflections. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Eileen, who's going to talk about the plans for your plans. Over to you, Eileen. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I don't know how I can really express my thanks and gratitude to everybody who joined in over this last month in these working groups for these exciting, challenging and ambitious action plans uh, um, that you've all created. I, I, I'm, I was sitting here just thinking, oh, you, even if a, a small proportion of these were able to be enacted, um, we would make a huge impact. Uh, so they are just terrific. You've done this virtually across challenging time zones uh, and it, it's an amazing outcome. Thank you. It's Thank been an you. intensive and demanding event and you've given your time to contribute to a cause that we all know is critical now more than ever. <clears throat> the rate of change of women rising to leadership positions, as we said right at the beginning, has been abysmal. We know that much excellent work has been done over the past decade with numerous action plans created, <clears throat> but we haven't seen enough change, as you have all noted. You were tasked to consider what has already been done and to develop recommendations that will break through in universities, industry and government to make that difference in each of your sectors, and you've done that, thank you. Now our challenge is to bring these plans to life. Our unique contribution is that our three universities, students and staff, our industry and government partners from diverse backgrounds and sectors have come together to identify breakthroughs that will work. And I was confident and said so at the launch that these plans will get traction. First, because the talent we brought together across these three, our three countries is exceptional. Second, because we have the strong support of the executive leadership teams at Arizona State University, King's College London and UNSW Sydney, all of whom have already committed to prioritising the action plan. So I was right to be confident. You've delivered and thank you. Breathing life into these action plans will be challenging but exciting. To demonstrate what it takes, here is a special message of support from Gail Kelly, who's a member of the Plus Alliance Advisory Board and a former CEO of Westpac and a renowned woman global leader. She shares her experience of what it takes to drive change and increase gender equity in leadership. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everyone. As a member of the Plus Alliance Advisory Board, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to say a few words on the occasion of this important conference. What will it take? Women in leadership by 2030. This is a great call to action, and it is a timely one. Progress on increasing women's representation and leadership, whether it's in industry, government or academia, remains frustratingly incremental. It's the right time to hold up a mirror and examine why progress has been poor and challenge ourselves with what we need to do differently. And of course, it's not just about accelerating the numbers, but also how do we expand the pathways? 
So thank you for coming together from diverse backgrounds and experiences, working virtually and at such unsociable times to come up with practical action plans. And it will take action. In my experience, transformative, sustainable change takes more than passionate belief in the goal. It takes a lot of planning, determination and hard work. I found this at Westpac, where on being appointed as CEO, I mistakenly thought there was enough momentum behind our Women in Leadership agenda. I found this was not the case. Without dedicated focus, we found ourselves slipping behind. And so we developed a strategy and a plan and systematically set about its implementation. This involved hardwiring a number of elements, such as targets, measurements, recruitment policies, training and development initiatives, but also soft wiring elements that drive cultural change. Things like regular communication of what we're doing and why, sharing stories, sharing best practice, calling out the behaviors that hold us back and holding small group sessions around the organization to drive alignment. The results were strong. We achieved our first goal of 40% women in leadership positions two years ahead of our target. And a few years later, we hit 50%. The learning for me was the importance of consistent focus driven from the top with clear strategies, actions, measurements, and plans. So thank you for bringing your insights and determination to this very important work. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about the outcomes. Thank you so much, Gail. Uh, what a, a great, powerful message, reflecting everything that all of you have said in your presentations and in the panels. We need consistent focus, driven from the top, with practical actions that are measured. Gail, of course, was speaking from experience. We take Gail's advice, and particularly that we must measure progress, as all of you have said, we must have data. We need to always hold the mirror up so that we know where traction is being gained, to learn from experience and to call out where we are not making progress. It's not enough for us to create these action plans. We want to achieve real change. A most exciting development that I'm delighted to tell you today is that we are partnering with Ms. Magazine to get the message out and to track our progress. And we also uh, have the exciting news that the action plans will be transformed into a living digital website that you and the public can follow and track as we achieve our goals. So from today, we will start the process of preparing for publication. And we are planning a virtual launch in the first quarter of next year, to which you are all, of course, invited. This brings us to the end of our final plenary, um, but it is certainly not the end of our involvement and connection with each other. Estee Lauder, the co-founder of her namesake cosmetic company and regarded as one of the most influential business geniuses of our time said, I never dreamed about success. I worked for it. And that sums up this amazing working month and it sums up everything that you have said. We are working at it. So in wrapping up, I want to say thank you to all of you who made this event possible, including our case study providers, our critical friends, our organising committee and behind the scenes technical support, and of course, all of you, our working groups. The group leads, our fabulous student ambassadors and our dedicated working group members. Your passion and your commitment to driving change has made this a very successful start for our action plans. Thank you. I have a very special acknowledgement and thanks to Lily Halliday, our event project and research manager, Professor Jenny Granger, our facilitator, and the indefatigable Small Plus Alliance team, Vanita Channon and Dr. Sarah Jones. Thank you. 
And to close this event, we thought it would be fun to share with you another tribute. This is an informal behind the scenes view of the many people who help make this such a successful event. We will see each other next year, in reality perhaps, if not virtually, to continue this essential and exciting work. We will keep you all updated. It will all be on our web page and we will be calling on you regularly if you're available. I do hope you all stay safe and thank you very much.